What's up, guys, and welcome back to the Boost Your Mycology... Oh, hang on. Boost <laughs> Your Biology podcast. Today, I'm here with a man that I met at the Biohacker Summit in Amsterdam. We have the founder of Mycopreneur, Dennis Walker. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Lucas. And may I say that your testosterone levels are looking through the roof today. Well done. <laughs> Geez, sometimes the things that come out of your mouth, Dennis, I'm not sure if it's actually you or AI speaking. <laughs> a little bit of both, honestly. All right. So, Dennis, maybe you want to um, outline to my listeners a little bit about your story. Like, what got you so fascinated in the world of uh, psychedelics? Mushrooms got me very interested in the broader world of psychedelics. At the age of 17, I started reading about them. I started hearing about them from my community. And this was prior to social media. I didn't have a Facebook or an Instagram or anything. So I was having to go learn the old fashioned way, going to libraries and checking out books, literally to learn about mushrooms, reading Terence McKenna, Mark Plotnet, Plotkin, who was an ethnobotanist at Yale. Then I went to school in San Francisco and connected with the legacy of Western psychedelic use there that's omnipresent across Silicon Valley and the creative industries as we all are familiar with now. So that's really what inducted me into the broader world of psychedelics and mushrooms and that journey continues today. Yeah, fascinating. In terms of um, your own experimentation and experience with um, medicinal mushrooms, I'd love to hear about maybe your first ever psychedelic experience. Maybe did you want to share that with my audience? Gladly. Yeah, I had been hearing about them and reading about them for quite some time, pouring through Arrowid forums. If anyone's familiar with Arrowid, that was really the preeminent resource and archive where you could read people's trip reports. You could read about the chemistry, the science behind mushrooms. And I just had the good fortune of introducing Earth and Fire Arrowid, the founders at the Psychedelic Science Conference in Denver that MAPS put on. So that was kind of a full circle moment. And by the time they actually came into my purview, psilocybin mushrooms, I already had a sense of, of background information about them and a sense of wanting to be very cautious, start low, go slow, which I still advise people to do. And I had a half eighth of mushrooms, which is about 1.7 grams in a very public setting with a group of people I trusted who had experience with these mushrooms before. And it was a really wonderful, transformative, inspiring, uplifting experience. And I'm very fortunate about that. And I attribute that to having a sense of, of a frame of reference for what maybe I could expect and also having a low dose. You know, I didn't come charging in with a 3.5 gram or four gram dose. I had enough where it was more than a micro dose but it was very manageable. I was very comfortable. I was confident. I had a baseline of experience with cannabis and that really shaped the next couple of years. And really in a lot of ways, the rest of my life, that, that one experience, because after having this really beautiful experience where I was at a County fair, I was in a hall of mirrors actually, when I started peeking and it was just this really humorous carnivalesque experience where I saw a tall, skinny version of me and a little short, fat version of me in the house of mirrors. And I realized these are just the projections of me that whatever I'm seeing, whatever I'm experiencing, there's a million different ways to look at yourself and to understand yourself. So I've processed this later on, not necessarily in the moment. Then I saw Ozo Motley play, who's a wonderful Grammy nominated Latin fuse, Latin fusion jazz band. And I really had a peak experience seeing the sunset, sharing these moments with my friends. And I was very hesitant to immediately go back into that experience after I had the initial experience. I wanted to read more about it. I wanted to talk to people about it. And I put six months between that first experience and my next experience. So I feel very fortunate that I had pretty good information and recommendations from people who had experience with mushrooms where I had a overwhelmingly positive, uplifting, beautiful first experience. And I hope that everybody, if they choose to learn about mushrooms to experience them, can be empowered and pre prepared for it and to have such a good first experience that they want to learn more about it before diving back into it or saying, no, that's not for me. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I think um, one thing around psychedelics, Dennis, is, uh, you know, they've received a lot of negative stigma, you know, in and amongst like different health spaces and uh, for treating different uh, mental diseases, things like that. If you were to like sort of outline, you know, 
you, you sort of mentioned set and setting being an important factor. You've mentioned dosage, such as start low, go slow. Um, you know, what are some other factors that people should be cautious of in terms of, you know, like these are potent medicines and they can, you know, significantly alter consciousness and uh, affect our, our thoughts and, and our behaviors and things like that. But what do you think are some of the problems that people, you know, run into when they get into the world of psychedelics? There are many, and I'm glad you asked. And one of the things that I try to contribute to the discourse around psychedelics is a more centrist, nuanced approach and making sense of them, especially in a capitalist Western framework. A lot of traditional societies that use mushrooms and ayahuasca and things, they have a very, very different framework and set and setting in general, right? Than we do today. So I feel fortunate to have had, again, the, the low dose experience where I could feel it and still make sense of my reality. I didn't go straight into this huge ego dissolution, questioning everything. It was more of a really beautiful, validating and, and warm experience overall. So I'm trying to be centrist and say, yes, mm. I think that psychedelics, mushrooms, et cetera, can be tremendously beneficial for people, but you have to have tempered expectations. This idea that gets trumpeted and over-marketed about like, Psychedelics are 10 years of therapy in one night, et cetera, et cetera. Those are very selective, very circumstantial claims. So I think it's good. You know, you don't want to be on the full prohibitionist side one necessarily mm. or on the full marketing hype side on the other end of the spectrum. I hope that we can find a more centric dialogue where people say, hey, this could be really good for a lot of people. And maybe it's potentially damaging if you're in the wrong mindset or have the wrong uh, set and setting, essentially. And then the, the last bit I'll offer there, I think, has to do with the importance of... There's a good one here. I'll, I'll hold on to that thought. There was somewhere else I was going with that. But I think that it's really important that we temper our expectations. Here's where I was going with it. I believe psychedelics and mushrooms can be great for the betterment of well people, too. There's this idea mm. that we need to diagnose someone and maybe it's going to cure or help alleviate PTSD, anxiety. I believe that's possible in a very structured setting, right? And health professionals should be involved. But what about like when I first took it or you seem like a very healthy, empowered individual, why shouldn't we also be able to use these things for the betterment of well people? And there are a number of wonderful brands and individuals involved in that pr process as well. Yeah, it's funny because, um, you know, if you look at the name of my podcast, it's Boost Your Biology. But I think towards the end of this episode i think i'm going to swap it to boost your mycology uh, i like that <laughs> in the beginning i caught that right away thank you <laughs> but um yeah i mean you raised some really great points around um set and setting and you know i think we're seeing now like many different societies like you mentioned maps you mentioned different you know um community groups that are coming together to share and showcase some of the research and you know demonstrate how they can be used for, like you said, the, the betterment of an already well person. So that's purely looking at enhancement, like what we see with, you know, at Silicon Valley, which I'm sure you've probably spent some time there or, or know some people there. A lot of individuals and entrepreneurs are, you, you know, leveraging the power of psychedelics, microdosing, psilocybin, um, LSD for cognitive enhancement. So, you know, this is a, this is a great discussion around you know, the broader applications for psychedelic use. Um, but my, my next question was going to be around, it's going to be quite a funny one, but is, you know, what's the weirdest thing or the funniest thing you've seen, you know, uh, from someone who's under the influence of psychedelics? Like what is probably the funniest thing you've, you've, you've witnessed? Quite a few ones, as you would imagine. One that is kind of humorous now, but it also speaks to the potential danger of psychedelics as I have a very good friend who one of our first conversations I had asked him hey you're into all this music I'm into we're traveling and doing fun things because I, I actually met him when I was teaching abroad overseas and I asked him have you ever eaten mushrooms before and his response immediately was yeah I got naked and punched a cop in the face and <laughs> that's like a a thing I was not prepared to hear. And fortunately, he's doing very well now. He's married, has children, fully employed, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just one of those things where he thought, yeah, like one thing led to the next, led to the next. Mm -hmm. And I was totally unprepared for what happened. So again, 
in a very twisted South Park carnivalesque sense, like maybe there's a bit of humor in there, but it's also obviously quite a serious subject matter. And definitely also have had a number of experiences traveling and you know, meeting people and, you know, doing things like at the bonfire and you're like, where did that person go? And then the, you see them the next morning and they're like, yeah, I just went off into the wilderness and I woke up and I had a bunch of berries in my pocket and uh, decided to, you know, that I could only eat nuts and seeds because I had a download that I should eat what squirrels eat. So like I've been around a lot of that kind of, you know, uh, really over the top thinking. And that's part of what I try to advise if people ask me to be like, stay with some people. You don't need to go off on your own if it's your first time and hang out, have a good time. Like, you know, hang out around the bonfire, hang out around the trip sitter because yeah, these substances really do have a propensity to trigger some, incredible outlandish thinking which is part of their benefit but you need to have that container where you know okay just because i had this download or this insight doesn't mean i need to act upon it right now another one i've mm. seen a lot is people wanting to call their parents or someone while they're under the influence and i would just generally advise probably wait until you come down a little bit make tomorrow if you want to call your mom and tell her all this stuff Tell her tomorrow. You don't need to call her right now and freak her out at 3 a.m. that you had an epiphany and that you're going to move to Tonga and start a start a center there or whatever. Like we can probably just wait till tomorrow. So those are a couple of things that come to mind. So this is uh, an interesting you know, aspect of psychedelic use is um, the fact that they can, you know, disrupt the default mode network. And, you know, we've we've heard about that quite a lot. And it's sort of acting as like a pattern interrupt, you know, interrupting your daily, you know, basic um routine thoughts i mean do you think that you know the, the, some of the benefits that people see from psychedelics are, are in relation to that aspect or do you think there's some other you know other superpower effect from these psychedelics i think the number one thing you can bank on when you take psychedelics is that they'll be disruptive and mm -hmm. disruption can be such a positive thing and it could potentially be a negative thing, right? So that's where all of the, the care comes in. And I'm pretty outspoken about my belief that people should have cognitive liberty. We should, we should empower people to choose cognitive liberty and defend that. And that being said, I think psychedelics can be very positive outside of a clinic, as we've seen in Silicon Valley elsewhere where I have spent a lot of time and, you know, I've been on the Google campus and hung out in Sausalito and, and so on and so forth with architects of the internet in many ways, you know, people who were very successful, dot com or VR entrepreneurs, et cetera. And they're using them outside of a clinical setting. And I think the difference there is that they are intelligent about how they're doing it. They're not just, you know, charging in blindly. And a lot of times their work is informed by those experiences. So I think that is really important to note that it's disruptive. And especially now, I think 2023, there's a lot higher of a concentration of people who identify as having mental illnesses than maybe there was in, in many ways in the 90s or 2000s. And that's a subjective claim, but it just feels like there are a lot more societal factors in play that are pushing people to be more stressed right? More, you know, having breakdowns, there's more veterans as we've seen, like uh, the United mm -hmm. States having been in two prolonged theaters of war. I've connected with a lot of veterans who have treatment, dis treatment resistant depression, PTSD, et cetera. These are things that are really, really happening over the last few years. And, and in that regard, it is wise and it behooves one as you're navigating this to, to really seek out that kind of therapy before and after that can be so yeah. beneficial, I believe. You know, you mentioned an, another really critical point, Dennis, isn't that, and that that is basically the you sort of said the after. So it's like the the the, the pre trip, the pre um, psychedelic experience intention, the actual period in which the user is subjected to the substance, and then the following, which is the integration phase, which a lot of people call it, which is the implementation or at least some sort of, you know, journaling or like, do, do you want to sort of explain what that integration phase might look like? Yeah. So keeping in mind that this is not fully my area of expertise, right? I speak a lot about mushrooms and all mushrooms, also functional mushrooms, mushroom coffee and lion's mane and things like that. But from a lot of personal experience, I've, I've learned, for example, when I first got interested in mushrooms and psychedelics, I was part of an artistic community. And a lot of us who were having these experiences 
we're taking those experiences and channeling them into art constructively, right? If you're around the music community, the art, the fine art community, the film industry, you're going to see a lot of essentially non-clinical, quote, unsanctioned psychedelic use. But these people are generally uh, channeling those experiences into something very constructive. And in many ways, that's a form of integration, right? Being able to journal about it, being able to process it. So I think that this is also a model we should be looking at, that there, there's never been more people who have been interested in psychedelics than right now. I'm firmly convinced of that. Even when you look at the 60s or back before then, going back to time immemorial, we have such a huge explosion of interest in the cultural mainstream, largely as a result of this, quote, shroom boom and psychedelic renaissance, where a lot of mainstream coverage has been devoted to the, quote, miracle cure or the potential of psychedelics. You look at any outlet, BBC, Fox News, et cetera, ESPN, right? They're all devoting primetime coverage and have over the last few years. Where can people actually get psychedelics or mushrooms? There's almost nowhere to, quote, legally get them, right? There are few people can go to Jamaica where there's an industry or the Netherlands, right? Few people can go to Iquitos and the Amazon. The majority of people who are hearing about these powerful substances are getting them from what we call the legacy market or the underground market. They're getting them from their neighbor or their cousin or they're growing them. They're ordering spores online. So that being said, I firmly believe we need to step up our education around these substances so that we don't have more of these experiences that are happening. You know, there's been a couple high profile very negative stories around mushrooms lately. A big one was this F, this pilot, right, for an airline in the United States who supposedly tried to down a plane while in the cockpit. There's a whole lot of rhetoric and it's a very loaded story. But there was just another one that's been circulating this week about a woman in Chile who supposedly attacked people under the influence of mushrooms. And like if we want you know, to mitigate the potential harms or harm reduction, as we call it, we need to be investing in realistic education and realistically understanding that people want and or need these substances sooner than the clinical horizon timeline is allowing for, which might be 2026, 2027. That's when you might start to see more FDA approved legal psychedelic treatments. I know you've got some in Australia already ahead of the curve on that, but the fact of the matter is that most people either can't afford it currently. You know, we have a model in Oregon, in the United States, costs $3,500 for a 3.5 gram mushroom trip. Most people are not in a position to justify affording that, and they're going to go get them from the million other places they can get them in Oregon. Well, we need to really enforce some good quality education, and a big part of that is going to be integration. Okay, you had this experience. What's next? What do you do with this? How do you actually make sense of it in a way that's uplifting and beneficial in your life and not causing you to just say, hey, I'm going to go do more. That was a great experience. I had this temporary disruptive relief from whatever I'm facing. Uh, I'm going to double that tomorrow. Like This is not the way to do it, but we currently don't have educational paradigms that really help people understand that. Yeah, you, you summarize that beautifully, Dennis. And, you know, we sort of mentioned the um, the disruptive nature of these psychedelics. I sort of thought of like a pretty funny saying is like, you know, you've got your chief executive officer and then you've got the chief disruptive officer. And so it's like you're booking in a meeting to hang out with your chief disruptive officer. And then, and then you just like... 100%. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in terms of like your... I mean, you've got a, you know... I think the way in which you've positioned yourself in the psychedelic space, I mean, you've got an excellent Instagram page with, you know, great, great content there. And I'll make sure to leave that linked in the show notes for those listening in. But um, how do you want to be perceived in the psychedelic space? Like what sort of voice do you want to have in the space? Are you more like um, you want to be perceived as an educator, more like satire? Like how do you want to be perceived? Definitely a mix of those two. I think satire is great. I've really enjoyed making it. And my rule of thumb when I'm creating content is can I get a genuine belly laugh out of myself? I think there's something very powerful and resonant where if you're authentically engaged in the process and it's benefiting you, it's going to attract the audience you want and it's going to send the message you want. So that's sort of my litmus test for if something gets published or released is is this making me laugh? Is my heart in it? And that's an ongoing process to try to find what do I find funny, right? What is humor to me? So satire is a big part of that. 
but I also have a background as an educator. I was a high school teacher for several years. I taught internationally before that. I've contracted with a number of universities and I see the importance of education and also creating comedic satirical inputs that can hook people and hopefully also educate people at the same time, which I'm really trying to do. And it's been quite successful at least over the last couple of years. Hmm. In terms of um, like psychedelics themselves, I mean, if we had to, you know, sort of ask the question, you know, if psychedelics could talk to us, what do you think they would say? Man, I'm still trying to answer that, but I will share that. I've had a number of direct downloads, as many people have, via mushroom experiences that any way you slice it, they were beneficial for me, right? And I'm pretty skeptical at this point of like anything that I experience while under the influence of psychedelics, I don't take it at face value. Like in the moment, if it's really impactful, write it down, come back to it later. But I think that, you know, when you're new to exploring these things, and it's happened to a lot of other veteran psychonauts and people I, I engage with, you'll just accept something that you experience or an intuition you have at face value. And that can be really disruptive. And maybe it's good for people, maybe it's not. Like if you get a download, as people do, that you should sell your house and you should move to this off-grid community, like, again, I think it's a good idea to sit on that before you immediately the next day go and sell your house, right? To be able to sit on it. So some of the value that I've accrued in that sense are like learning to be a little bit skeptical of my own thoughts and to know just because I have this thought or download doesn't mean it's reality. But two phrases that come to mind that I had whispered into my ears by mushrooms have stayed with me to this day. One of those is to create answers, not expectations. It was just this brilliant, pithy, succinct little phrase that came to me. And it's how I approach a lot of my work, where a lot of our letdowns and frustrations happen because we form expectations about the way someone should behave or the way we should have performed or something should have happened. Those expectations, you rarely meet them. But if you take action, you do something, you make it an answer, well, there you go already. Like, they, you know, you learn from that. So I approach my writing, my creating in that way as it's an ongoing conversation. I'm going to put out a hot take. I'm going to put out a piece. I'm going to get feedback. I'm going to learn from it. If it works, if it resonates with my audience, I double down on it. If it didn't land, I move on, right? But it's this idea of getting over your inner critic, I think. That inner critic that tells you, you're not good enough. You don't deserve to have high testosterone. You don't deserve to be successful, right? We need to learn how to put that little monkey brain in its place and, uh, and be brave and go forward. So create answers, not expectations. The other one, a sort of phrase I got was, lose the loser attitude. And this was at a point in my life where I was just kind of moping about things. You know, I had had a bad breakup. I had had a bad business deal go wrong, like multiple things as all of us have in our lives. And I really was drawing the victim card and it was like, poor me, poor. And that's, I realized that's how I was treating the world after that. Like, oh, I'm a victim here. And that little phrase, lose the loser attitude. It was so comical and humorous, almost like it was mushrooms were poking fun at me being like, you don't need to mope around through the rest of your life. This happened. You learn move on, go create some answers. So yes, I do think that we can, uh, we can learn things, but we should also only take the things that really serve us and that work and that we can apply on a daily basis with us. Yeah, that's incredible. In terms of understanding the evolution of psychedelic use, I mean, I'd, I'd imagine you've spent time with um, tribes and spent time, you know, understanding the historical uses for some of these medicines. It doesn't even have to be psilocybin it might be some other bizarre you know botanical medicine that like hardly anyone knows about but in terms of like the the ritual and the usage and the ceremonial practices like if you had to like go back and and sort of map out how they came to to use in terms of human use did you want to sort of explain sort of expand upon like how they historically started like how we understood the medicines was it through just experimentation, ceremonial practices. Can you sort of elaborate on that? One thing I've heard from tribes directly is that they observed animals eating certain substances. And, and for example, like a jaguar nibbling on an ayahuasca vine, right? And of course, this is filtered through certain representatives of a tribe, like of the Chipibo or whatever. But observing nature and observing nature. Another thing I've heard in the cosmologies or the origin stories, specifically with ayahuasca, was 
uh, teachers or whatever you want to call them, extra dimensional beings or, or you know, essentially legendary uh, beings taught them how to use these substances. Because if you think about it logically, there are, what, millions of different plants in the Amazon jungle. And this very specific combination of the chacruna and the bee copy vine, right? You combine them in a certain way and it creates this incredible transformative visionary experience. It's quite unlikely that people would have gone out and combined every single plant in the rainforest. So as it was told to me, at some point in time immemorial, and we don't really have a timeline for when these substances were first used. We have educated guesses, but it keeps getting older and older. And the same with Iboga in Africa. I've heard that these were really, really old ancient practices that came from somewhere else, essentially, that we don't know who taught them to the people, but the tribes themselves have said that, that this is sort of the way that they found out about it. One other thing I can speak to, having spent time with the Mazatec indigenous people and the uh, Sierra Mazatec Mountains in the south of Mexico, where Maria, Maria Sabina is from. And they were the only intact mushroom ritual that was found, essentially. There has been a lot of use of different mushrooms or evidence, but there's been no intact ritual that's really been found besides with the Mazatec people. And a lot of times, the curandero, or the shaman, if you will, they ate the substances and the people did not eat them. So I think that's worth noting. Like it's sort of been twisted in this model now, especially with a lot of retreat centers. And I've definitely done this where people go and everyone drinks ayahuasca, everyone eats mushrooms, but really traditionally the healer was the person that ate these. So people would go visit the curandero and tell them their problems. And then the curandero would drink the ayahuasca or eat the mushrooms and they would see the cure. They would interface with the mushrooms. So I think this idea about like, a lot of group rituals, it probably happened, but I don't know that that was the norm historically. And the last thing I'll mention, there's a book coming out soon written by a DMT researcher named Andrew Gallimore, who's based in Tokyo, does a lot of cutting edge DMT research. And he claims, which I haven't seen too much more evidence of this, but I think he's an absolute authority on the subject matter we should listen to. He claims there's ample evidence of different tribes in the Amazon who drink ayahuasca in decidedly non-ceremonial contexts in the sense that like they'll drink ayahuasca with beer and have all night dancing parties where they're snorting coca or doing coca as well. So like, it's just to show that there's not necessarily a one size fits all approach. There's different customs in different areas. And anybody who tells you there's only one way to do this is probably trying to sell you something. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, understanding the like sort of mechanisms around how some of these plants work i mean from my limited research from what i understand there a, a lot of them have anti-addictive qualities in terms of um you know minimizing addictions or helping to break addictions i mean you sort of mentioned iboga which is you know, ibogaine you know that's pretty well researched in terms of minimizing addictions um did you want to sort of maybe explain have you spent time with people who have used Ibogaine? Have you, do you, do you, what do you know about it? And do you want to sort of share that with, with my audience? Sure. The one thing I'll mention, I'm not particularly well connected to that plant. I've never done it. I've never visited the Buiti in Gabon. But yes, there's a lot of legitimate research that suggests that it's tremendously powerful at disrupting addiction. And in Mexico in specific, there, there are a lot of ibogaine centers and part of that is the relaxed scheduling and regulation around natural medicines and it's both a blessing and a curse in a lot of ways because not just iboga but also things like 5-MeO DMT mushrooms peyote it's all here it's all in Mexico where I am at the moment actually but because of that relaxed scheduling it invites a lot of unscrupulous opportunists who want to do their own ceremonies and it becomes a profit driven uh, pursuit essentially where it's not centering the healing necessarily it's more centering the profiteering and there's ample evidence of this as well and there are a number of well-documented instances of irresponsible centers etc so i think it's great that it's available somewhere and that that people can come and get that relief and that healing here but it also speaks to our need as a community and psychonauts and evangelists of these plants for us to hold bad actors accountable, which is happening more and more. Because for a lot of the time in an industry that's totally, totally unregulated, for example, ayahuasca tourism in Peru or ibogaine or 5-MeO-DMT in Mexico, 
if something bad happens, many times it can be swept under the rug because people can be paid off. News stories or you know mainstream outlets aren't going to be covering something that happened in the jungle necessarily. So it just really speaks to the rest of us when we are aware of these things. We have to hold bad actors accountable. And th this is an ongoing and a very difficult conversation that has no clear answers at the moment because it's either... Okay, well, then if we start to regulate all this, like, then that creates a incentive for, you know, only the people who have a lot of money who could pay off officials to do it. So we're kind of right in the middle of all that right now as an industry, quote unquote. But at the end of the day, I'm very optimistic. I think that humans will prevail. We will figure out how to use these things. We just have mm -hmm. to have a sense of humor about it and, uh, and also really invest in reciprocity and decolonization, which are very loaded words. But... I think it's the only way to responsibly, responsibly, collectively mainstream these medicines or these uh, compounds is to honor and give tribute and to pay and help and, and listen to the stewards of these plant medicines and substances before we took them over in the West and decided that we were going to clinicalize them and put ayahuasca in a pill, et cetera, et cetera. I think that if you're focused primarily on the bottom line with these substances, you missed the bigger picture. Yeah, you've raised some great points there, Dennis. And as far as like the, the user experience or the customer journey, um, let's say, for example, somebody is interested in doing, you know, a retreat in Peru. Um, you know, there's things they need to be careful of in terms of, you know, are they a verified or a legitimate um, treatment center or they purely focus on the bottom line and just, you know, screwing customers over. Is there like a resource for those individuals who want to find legitimate um, retreats and, 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 and practices and things like that? One that comes to mind is Retreat Guru is pretty good about it in terms of having a platform for different providers. And they have expelled certain centers because of these types of complaints that people might have. So that's one uh, Chacruna is a pretty good resource. That's uh, Bia Labachi, a Brazilian anthropologist, or at least an a entheogenic researcher. And I know that they've been involved with these types of trying to elevate the dialogue around reciprocity and, and better stewardship over these medicines. And those come to mind, and it really depends on who you ask. But what I would advise if somebody is looking at a center or looking at going somewhere, really do your due diligence. Just because you see on TripAdvisor that the center has this many reviews and stars and whatever, most people don't know, but you can actually pay to have bad reviews removed on TripAdvisor. And ayahuasca centers, it's well known that they do that. And I have ample evidence having had a connection to a lawyer who defended an ayahuasca center where there were numerous complaints about the proprietor in specific who was running it but he was able to pay to remove the bad press and the reviews. So just like contact people who have been there, do your due diligence, because it really is a shame that when people go in search of healing, hearing about all these things, it's, it's definitely possible that your traumas could be exacerbated if you're not doing it carefully. And even if you are a well person, you could end up leaving with these new traumas you didn't even know about. So again, uh, I'm trying to be nuanced with this. You know, I'm not just on this, uh, unabashedly equivocating for psychedelic therapy. Like I'm hugely bullish on it. I think it can be profound for people, but it would be irresponsible for me to be here and for all of us collectively to just say, oh, everybody should go do this. No matter what condition you're in, no matter what you're facing, like you go drink ayahuasca, you go take mushrooms, it's going to help you. Like that's a totally faulty narrative that we need to be mindful of and, <clears throat> and temper the expectations again. And I think you're doing a good job at that, you know, in terms of your social media, your presence, you're sort of, um, you know, helping to elucidate the fact that some of these medicines can be extremely potent and sort of unlock, open a can of worms that you may not be ready for. And if you're doing it under a setting or a certain setting that's like not really conducive to a healing state or having that support, it can, it can actually, you know, I've heard stories about some people that have used them um, well, silly, I've had some friends who have, you know, um, a, you know, a, a naive user has gone in and just gone for a, me, a, a flood dose from the get go. And so you hear about, you know, his experience there and that sort of enabled or unlocked this baseline level of anxiety that he never had before. Um, and so that's like an example of, you know, it, it's, it's important to, to look at the nuance around the use. And I think you're doing a really good job at sort of you know, at least trying to help to 
to bring that to the forefront. Thanks. And I'd also like to mention, this is where I favor microdosing, you know, and I know it's something you've talked about that if you're microdosing and I've been critical of it. Also, I have friends who are researchers who have done actual legit double blind studies at major labs and they're kind of inconclusive, but the jury is still out in a lot of ways. But what is for sure is how many people have shared that microdosing has hugely impacted and benefited them. And I'm aware of this, like even if there's a bit of a placebo effect potentially in play, which I'm not saying there is, but I'm saying that's what a lot of research at the moment has indicated, and there's ongoing clinical trials into it. So, but the one thing that won't happen very, very likely is you probably are not going to have a freak out or, you know, a crazy uh, experience you're not prepared for when you're microdosing. And there's a huge subset of the population that don't want this big transformative, jarring, impactful experience. I totally get that. Like, so, so I think that's one thing to mention. And it's also another reason I like what I call the museum dose or the mini dose, which is again, what I got to start out with. If you have 1.5 grams, you're not going to be having an ego dissolution. You know, like I wouldn't advise driving a car or anything like that. Certainly not. But in many ways, especially if you're with some friends, it's a nice, gentle, introductory dose that could be all you need for a lot of people. So I'm a huge proponent of that. I think when we start to get into these like freakouts we've talked about a little bit, it's really for the most part coming at the four gram, five gram, seven gram range. Mm -hmm. And that's a real concern because now with the ubiquity of different, and I'm speaking with mushrooms here specifically, because those are pretty easy to get. <clears throat> Mushroom chocolates are floating all over. I've been at conferences where I've been given over an ounce of mushrooms, right? And like people know who I am, so there's part of that. But, you know, it just seems reckless if like you are giving out samples to people and then someone's like, oh, I just got, you know, 10 grams of mushroom chocolate. I got to jump on a flight tomorrow. I'm going to eat these right now. I, I really think we're going to see more of these stories. We already have been seeing them. So it behooves us as a community to start advocating for this type of sensible education. Like, Maybe start with a microdose. Maybe start with a one gram dose or a 0.7 dose before you eat that four gram chocolate that your friend just shared with you at Splendor in the Grass. If you know what you're doing, power to you. But if you're kind of new to it, I would totally recommend just stick in that microdose, mini dose, museum dose range. You know, it's funny because, you know, over the years, Dennis, I've had quite a lot of, a lot of experimentation and use with like just general like medicinal mushrooms, things like cordyceps, reishi, lion's mane. Um, and I've had some pretty epic experiences with cordyceps mushroom. I mean, I used that for probably two and a half, two and a half years straight um, as I was playing soccer. And I always felt the difference when I used it. I felt like I had better breathing ability. I had better stamina and energy. Um, but in terms of, you know, your own experimentation, like obviously you've delved into the psychedelics quite a lot, but in general, what else have you explored from the non-psychedelic side of mushrooms? I love this question, Lucas. And I always try to lead with the fact that Micropreneur was always designed to be about platforming mushroom entrepreneurs, not about talking about psychedelics. It just happens to be the subject sure. du jour everybody wants to talk about. But I'm such a firm believer and advocate of eating more mushrooms, literally. Like put some shiitakes on your plate, right? I know people who say that every bite you take should be 50% mushrooms. And maybe that's a more radical take on it, but like they're not going to hurt you. They're only going to help you. Like it's so well documented how many people benefit from different supplements. So like here right around me, like I got a, my micro boost mushroom coffee, you know, and like that's not it. I've got my everyday dose mushroom coffee. Like people ask me these all the time. So I only, you know, work with really, really high quality brands doing fruiting body extracts that I can trace and they're third party certified. I've got lots of, you know, I've got right here immunity, turkey tail, chaga, reishi. I've got chaga tincture from from Kappa. So that's the first thing is like, just do a whole bunch of mushrooms, learn about them. They might have different timelines that they work best with you. For example, Taro, the founder of Four Sigmatic has written a wonderful book on adaptogens that my friend Danielle Ryan Broida co-authored. And they have a timeline in it about like, hey, maybe cordyceps are really good in the morning because it's sort of an energetic impulse, right? It's energy. Do you want to be eating cordyceps right before you go to bed? Not necessarily. Uh, maybe reishi is good before you go to bed. It's much more of a calming, right? Relaxing effect. So I think it's good to just have your supplement and find what works for you. Work with different brands, you know, uh, grow them yourself too. That's the beautiful thing about mushrooms. Like you can grow them. Like, yeah, you can go out and spend 
$300 a month on supplements, and many people will do that or spend more. You can also grow them. They're not particularly difficult. Yeah, there's a learning curve, but you know that that's part of the beauty of being a micropreneur. Uh, the platform, the, the namesake is that, yeah, yeah, like I know a woman in Africa, in Uganda, who's taught 400 critically vulnerable and impoverished women how to grow oyster mushrooms, and now they're doing lion's mane. And it's like created this whole livelihood for them and what they don't sell, they eat with their families or they take. So it's just like, I see mushrooms as the gift that keep on giving. We've barely scratched the surface. There's a, a lot of interest right now in something like Amanita, right? Which is psychoactive. But like most people are not familiar with Amanita, but because of a loophole, essentially it's legal. So now there's a bunch of Amanita gummies. You know, I have some right here and I'm like, okay, I have to research this. I don't even know how to onboard these into my routine, but <laughs> Long story short, eat more mushrooms, learn about what you like, join a mycological society. That's a huge one. If you have one in your city, in like Melbourne and Sydney, wherever you are, there's a lot of chapters worldwide of different mycological societies. And if you just Google like New York Mycological Society, you'll find out when they're meeting. If you can't make it, they usually have a virtual meeting. You go to those, you meet so many people who, who really just want to share a lot of times. Like one thing I love about the mushroom community, so many people are not concerned about nickeling and diming you and like just making money off you. Like so many people are doing great. They have robust businesses and they're like, here, let me share this with you. Let me, you know, I want you to feel better. And that's what I love about it is like, I want people to feel better. I want us to look better. I want us to, you know, think quicker not experience cognitive decline, you know, ward off Alzheimer's and all these things are clinically and historically proven to be possible with more mushroom use and with the use of certain adaptogenic mushrooms. Mm. One thing I want to outline for my audience as well, listening in is um, this term psychoactive, you know, gets thrown out, thrown around a lot in terms of, um, you know, how things affect the brain and that, that term psychoactive, you know, you look at something like cordyceps mushroom, they say it's like, they would they would look at it and say it's it's not psychedelic, but it's definitely psychoactive. And even if you look at like different reishi mushroom, it's not, again, it's not psychedelic, but it's, it's still going to have an effect on the brain. Um, and this is something that I've seen with, you know, lion's mane and even the new mushroom that's quite popular right now, which is tiger milk mushroom, um, which is like a nerve growth factor mimetic. And, you know, you see a lot of research around how medicinal mushrooms can help with brain function and, you know, saving off cognitive decline, things like that. So just that term, Dennis, like psychoactive, when people say things aren't psychoactive, I think they just need to remember that like cordyceps will still affect your mood and motivation. Dude, psychoactive, psychedelic, et cetera, are such crude labels. And I'm actually, I've been assigned an article for a platform to write about this because an increasing number of people have brought up what you just mentioned about like, it's mm. kind of misleading a lot of the times when you say like a psychoactive mushroom or a psychedelic substance, like that incorporates such a broad array of different experiences and lived experiences. And yeah, hundred percent, for example, Myco Mentor and, and, Herisium Labs, Performance Fungi. They're all the same individual running those. And that's a world-class brand that I'm a huge proponent of. And they do lion's mane specific. They're really known for their lion's mane tinctures. And he's always said, if you can't feel your lion's mane tincture working, then it's not a good lion's mane tincture. There's a real problem, which I actually just had a, one of my podcasts featured in Rolling Stone talking about this, which I was st super stoked about. But there's a real problem with fairy dusting is one word for it, where brands will come in and they'll just throw a little bit of lion's mane in their supplement stack and then they'll market it as lion's mane. So then unsuspecting consumers will buy a lion's mane supplement and they don't feel anything. And they'll be like, oh, I've been taking lion's mane. It's like, yeah, because you bought from a brand that just is throwing, you know, a couple milligrams of this or whatever on top of a bunch of other stuff and then using the buzzword. And that's why you have to really do your due diligence and don't just trust me and the brands I've name dropped here. Really look into brands about like, fruiting body extracts, really talk to people like, you know, a lot of good brands will have an, an educational outlet as well, like Mushroom Revival, my friend Alex Dorr, great brand, the first USDA certified organic cordyceps farm in the United States. And he's got a website and videos and articles where you can see, oh, these people know what they're talking about, right? They really know. So look into all of that because yeah, like if you take cordyceps, you should be able to know that you took cordyceps. You take lion's mane, you should be able to really clearly 
tell that you've taken it. And, and full stop, if you're taking mushroom supplements and you're not actively feeling them, look into other supplements and, uh, or double the stack, if you will. Yeah, so I, I, can, um, I can share my experience with a particular cordyceps mushroom that I use from um, Amsterdam, actually. It's from a company called Oravita. Um, and it's one that I recommended to my brother as well when he was suffering with some chest infection because it's obviously great for immune health. Um, and that Orivita cordyceps mushroom, like that one there is like, you know, there's that phrase that it's not even really a word. It's like feelable. Like, can you even feel subjectively notice the, the, um, the mushroom itself? And like, I compared that particular mushroom to like, a, a, I've tried so many different cordyceps mushrooms, but that one there in particular had such a powerful effect on like energy, um, motivation, like drive, things like that. And I was like, yeah, the quality, and this is as a naturopath, I mean, I've studied herbal medicine quite extensively. I understand the importance of um, correct standardizations, the right extractions, harvesting, um, different things like that. And so just experimenting with that cordyceps mushroom just made me realize like, yeah, there's huge variability in terms of even though a mushroom is a mushroom, the way in which it's you know, um, you know, brought together and put to the market is, is very important to understand. And it's an ongoing issue right now with the supplement market because supplements, at least in the United States, are not regulated, right? Like they're not FDA approved. So for example, I can launch a supplement company tomorrow and go order a bunch of bulk mushrooms or, or powder without even getting it third party tested, having no certificate of analysis. I can then proceed to create these capsules, have a brand and sell it to you as a mushroom. So it's just really important to, to connect with people like yourself. And, and, you know, I try not to be the authority. I really focus on platforming authorities. That's kind of been the bent with micropreneurs. I'll often tell people like most of my perspectives are informed by world-class and world-renowned experts that are actively doing clinical research. People like Jeff Chilton, who's been commercially mushroom farming since 1973, right? And people who actually really know what they're talking about and have the lab results and the pedigree to prove it. That's really my thrust with my micropreneur. And it's something that has endeared me to a lot of these actors when they see, oh yeah, you're really trying to be an independent platform that is, that is interviewing people who know what they're talking about. And you know, that's, that's mm. certainly worked out to this, to this point in time. Yeah. In terms of, um, amplifying or enhancing the effects of psychedelics or um, different compounds like have you reliably figured out a way to like either make the effects more apparent or more obvious has it been you know by taking them fasted or combining them with other things like well the things that come to my mind are, are, are serotonin amplifiers like agmatine and different things like that but just curious to know like have you sort of um looked into ways to sort of amplify or, or, or enhance the effects even stronger? I haven't when looking at functional mushrooms, I'll generally just take supplements that I like. And for example, like a, a bottle of lion's mane tincture, like I'll take half of that sometimes, you know, when people are just taking little drops, but having it on good authority from people who do this full time and make it. And they tell me, yeah, I drink a full bottle of my tincture sometimes. And I feel like the guy in limitless, which is a cultural reference of someone who like immediately has really good callback of memory and like thinking very quickly. And yeah, the, I, I like to bio assay, right. And I think everybody's physiology is very different and your psychology is different. So you try to find what works for you. And in that regard, Probably mushroom wise, what I found to really amplify the effects is taking bigger doses of psilocybin mushrooms specifically. I'm a firm advocate of macro dosing, but again, you need to know what you're doing. You need to know that you're going to just chill on your couch. You're not going to get up and drive your car or whatever. So I feel like at this point, because mushrooms are so popular, I have to kind of like couch my advocacy and harm reduction and right and talk about these things. But like, I think there are a lot of people who will try a small dose of mushrooms and be like, ah, didn't really do much for me. And I want to say, hey, if you're called to it, if it's something you feel about and you do your research, take a dose, man. Like you can take five grams. You can take seven grams in a lot of ways. And obviously other people will have, you know, if you talk to a clinical lab 
person who's focused on that, they will say, don't do that. But again, again, it's like, well, we're kind of taking the trade out of their hands because honestly, with the psychedelic mainstreaming and corporatization, I'm not anti-money. I want to make that very clear. Like I like making money. I, I want psychedelic companies to do very well. But the fact of the matter is that the majority of profit that comes from, quote, psychedelic mainstreaming, it's not coming from mushrooms or ayahuasca or whatever. It's coming from the therapist, from the clinical setting, from the insurance, from the real estate. So like, just be mindful of that when you start to see like, oh, you know, I'm investing in this company or this, that, and the other. It's like, how are they going to make money on something that we can grow for free and I can share with you for free? That's not where the money is. The money is in the infrastructure around it. Yeah. In terms of your um, future direction and, you know, what you've got planned in the next like three to five years, like I'm curious to know for you, Dennis, like what does that look like? Are you Are you keen on continuing to do exactly what you're doing today or do you have like some other higher level vision or mission that you're that you've got brewing great question i've got a couple you know i was just in miami and i'm pleased to share that micropreneur won media company of the year at the wonderland awards which is a quite large industry event that had a lot of major players and pharmaceutical companies so it was very validating in a sense and i had a lot of people asking me these questions and i've been approached by various VCs and funds who, you know, talk about like, what's your actual strategy? It's like, they, they want to invest in companies that actually have a plan, which I don't <laughs> fully have figured out. And that's something I'm working on. A couple of things come to mind. I'd love to start doing more international events, kind of like what we did with biohacking, biohacking summit. I love that they're doing an event in Tokyo this year. They're doing an event in London, right? I think that's really cool. And I'd love to do something in Dubai and something in Ibiza, right? So that's one angle that I've kind of got the ball rolling on already with more announcements coming soon. Another one that I think the basis of everything I'm doing right now is really journalism. It's writing. Like all of the content I'm doing, it starts off as writing. And I've been very fortunate this year to publish with High Times a couple of articles, you know, which is an immensely influential institution with media, especially in regards to psychedelics and cannabis, and have had a few features come out in Rolling Stone and working on a few more. So that's really kind of the, my pie in the sky, if you will, is like if I can start getting more of this mainstream publication opportunity like with with very, you know Forbes Rolling Stone I think that that's where I want to be because yeah I, I, I have a lot to say and like there's something about being picked up by those social proof institutions and like major brands that really extend a lot of opportunities in the future uh, I'm booked for South by Southwest with my panel that I uh, same panel I was at Canada or in uh, Wonderland in Miami with and I'm very bullish on this panel we talk about the legacy market, the underground psychedelic market, the market where everybody realistically gets their psychedelics from. So very excited for that. I was at South by Southwest last year as press. This year I get to be a speaker. And just today, as I may have mentioned, I got invited to participate in a mushroom festival in England that I'm very excited about with a lot of people that I'm familiar with or I've worked with before. And there's quite a few other things on the horizon so yeah, all, all of that. But ultimately I see Micropreneur as a media platform. It's a media platform through and through. And I, I'll just briefly touch on this because it's something that I'm going through right now. But I was actually deplatformed on Instagram last week, very surprisingly, very randomly and arbitrarily. And it, I had zero content strikes, zero warnings. And I did a uh, advertisement with a Canna brand, K-A-N-N-A. -A -A. Yeah. You're probably familiar with, totally legal, South African Gee. herb. Boom, hit with a ban, permanent ban. I've got people working on recovery. But actually, ironically, since that happened, I've got more invitations, media interests, sponsorship pocket, than like ever before because a lot of people are dealing with it. And they're like, that's pretty unfair what happened to you. Like people see what I'm doing. They see the impact I've had. They see the reception. And then just to be blacklisted immediately. So, you know, I'm optimistic actually that this is going to be a good thing. And I'm working on a, a story right now uh, involving it. But yeah, so so – it actually forced me to do more content on my own dot com and newsletter that I own to drive more traffic there, you know, and I, I know a lot of us creators have dealt with this, but it's like, how do you justify focusing on your dot com when all the traffic is already on Instagram and TikTok, et cetera? That's why we're on those platforms, because you already have a sea of eyeballs swimming past your content. And to try to direct them to a domain that you own, you're going to get a fraction of the traffic. Realistically, that being said, I'd rather build for the long run because what am I going to do? Like build this Instagram up again. I was at 25,000 followers. It was rapidly growing. You know, there's shadow bans in place for talking about psychedelics. 
None of that exists on my .com. So now it creates an opportunity where I've had quite a few of these gray market companies and very professional ones, I may add, who often have forward facing, you know, functional mushroom or legitimate companies. They're wanting to advertise on my .com now. So, it, you know, I, I'm still kind of like navigating that whole situation, but it's just quite interesting that like, I always believe like when something happens to you, it's a learning experience. It's a growth opportunity, full stop. Doesn't matter if you get shut down, if this happens, if that happens, it's not a bad thing. Like it might be disorientating, it might be frustrating, but really it's going to ultimately incentivize growth if you look at it that way. Yeah. And I want to definitely make sure to leave those linked in the show notes, obviously your website. Um, and, you know, if you want to maybe share with my listeners, Dennis, I mean, I'm a big fan of what you do. I can definitely see the passion. And, you know, I think you're a great spokesperson for representing at least some aspect of the psychedelic space. So, and I think you've done a, an incredible job with, you know, your, your, your media as well. So did you want to let my audience know where they can connect with you, where they can find you um, and all your socials? Absolutely. So Mycopreneur, M-Y-C-O-P-R-E-N-E-U-R, everywhere on the internet, it's, you know, on all the platforms. I would just Google that. Instagram was my highest traffic platform, which is now Mycopreneur Official, which I'll make sure to link. Yeah. I may get the other account back, but I'm not holding my breath. And the .com, you know, Mycopreneur.com, I'm stoked about that domain authority. It's getting more features and international press, which I'm quite happy about. And Mycopreneur at gmail.com. And the fact of the matter is, I really want to build with everyone. You know, I think having one on one connections, like what Lucas and I are doing right here, I want that with your audience too. And like, bearing in mind, it's impossible to have the bandwidth to do a million projects. I typically I answer every DM, every email. I want to jump on a call with you. I want to build with you. And for example, there's a friend of mine who runs trip sitting blog and podcasts. He's doing great work. He told me a year ago, he goes, you were the first person to answer my D DM who actually had a platform and I knew who you were and you responded when I said, want to come on the podcast? And you're, you're like, absolutely. He's like, I sent like 20 people those messages and didn't get a response. You did. Now his platform has a bigger traction than mine since I've been taken off Instagram. And that's the way it works. And that's why like, I want to support, influence, help, extend that. I don't care if you're just getting started or if you have a random question. There's no stupid questions. I'm here for you. Yeah, I love that attitude and I love the um, the mindset around just constantly sharing and um, collaborating. I've, I've always said that at the start of my entire Instagram was like one of my biggest, I would say one of my biggest strengths was my mindset around collaboration and that's like I'm just open to connecting with like-minded people who love to share health information that can better the world. Like it's very clear that that's been my mission from the, from day one and it still holds tr holds true to today. So like in terms of, you know, that aspect of your, you know, the way you're going about things, like it's a, you know, it's very you know, admirable. And, and I think a lot of people would, would respect that a lot. So um, yeah, Dennis, thanks so much for coming on the show. I'll make sure to leave those linked in the show notes. Um, and I'm looking forward to, you know, jumping on your podcast to chat about some other topics, you know, we can um, discuss that shortly. Absolutely. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Lucas. Let's all boost our mycology and biology simultaneously. <laughs> That's it. Awesome. Thanks, Dennis. We'll, uh, we'll speak soon. Cheers. All right. Well, I know the Riverside hustle, so I'll leave the